Hello, everyone. A very warm welcome to all of you. Thank you for joining us today for the webinar, MHC Biology at Africa, Get Hands-On Training and Conduct Independent Research. I'm Himi Brooke and I work with the Office of Outreach at Ashoka University. Joining me today are Professors Anup Padman Padmanabhan and Professor Bhutri Raman, both Assistant Professors of Biology at Ashoka University. We also have the MSc Biology Coordinator, Professor Katsuturi Mitra, with us. A very warm welcome to you, Professor. Before we begin, I want to inform our audience that the deadline to apply to the MSc Biology program at Ashoka University is 26th of April, 2024, so apply soon. Now, without further ado, let's get started. Over to you, Professor. All right, so should I begin? Yes, Professor. Okay. Let me just share my slides. You're muted. Uh, Professor, you're on mute. Yes, apologies. A couple of students just came into my room, so I just asked them to have a seat uh, and, and wait for them. I, I Can all of you see my slides? Yes, Professor, they're visible. All right, wonderful. Let me just try and begin. Okay, so uh, welcome to all of you who are um, uh, interested in pursuing the MSc Biology program at Ashoka. Um, so as you can see, uh, Ashoka is a campus, uh, most of the year, a very sunny campus. Um, and um, located near Sonipat. And we have a wide variety of uh, biology faculty um, who are actually really excited about the master's program. And um, uh, we would really like to give you a flavor of the program. We're not gonna talk for too long so that you have time to ask us questions. So I will just take you through um, a few slides introducing you to um, the, the program and to the um, uh, the uh, especially focusing on the ecology evolution um, uh, people in the in the department, and then um, Anoop uh, uh, will uh, introduce you to um, the, the the folks who do more cellular molecular biology type stuff, and um, uh, and I'll be um, uh, and then we'll sort of wrap up in in ten to fifteen minutes and uh, take questions. Okay, so. Um, you know our biology program has um, an undergraduate uh, component. Um, undergraduates do a three-year degree. There's a fourth year, which is called the ASP program. And that takes about, um, uh, that's one year. And uh, although now under NEP, these are likely to be fused in a single four-year program, right? And there's a PhD program. Uh, the master's program is our youngest program. Uh, it's also why it's the most exciting program. And um, you um, already know that it's a two-year program, uh, which is customizable based on your interests. 
and its focus is on research. It's a research intensive program. And um, really, if I had to tell you what differentiates our program from others is that we uh, emphasize um, a curiosity driven approach. Um, and we have a lot of um, uh, faculty uh, who uh, are engaged in interdisciplinary work. So if you are interested in things that don't fit within the narrow confines of other departments, then this would be the right place for you. Um, most of us are looking at problems from multiple disciplinary lenses and are using multidisciplinary approaches. Um, and um, you know the, the thematic areas that uh, we cover, the multidisciplinary thematic areas that we cover range in, in uh, scale from single molecules to whole organism work to ecosystem level work, right? And we have uh, cell molecular developmental biology approaches. Uh, we have a behavior ecology and evolution approach. Um, and then we have a lot of single molecule, um, biophysics, biochemistry, structural biology um, folks. Um, there are people who um, do uh, a lot of disease biology that straddles these various levels of um, organization. So people who focus on cancer, on rare diseases, on antimicrobial resistance, on cardiometabolic disorders and so on. And we have um, um, computational and mathematical biology folks who really synthesize from work done across these areas. Um, and we also have a lot of collaborations across departments with uh, people in physics, um, and um, chemistry, of course, um, environmental science, um, uh, you know, uh, but also history, uh, because we have some uh, very exciting work, for example, on, um, um, on uh, you know, um, archaeology, which involves looking at history, but often with tools that, um, for example, with carbon dating that involve um, uh, you know, chemical and biochemical approaches, uh, but also looking at um, uh, genetics and what it um, reveals to us about history alongside uh, other historical methods. So we uh, do, um, that's a specialization of our, um, of our uh, department at Ashoka that, that is rare to find um, in India. Um, and of course, with psychology, a couple of us are um, joint faculty in biology and psychology uh, and a lot of overlap with computer science as well. So um, the areas of specialization that we cover uh, and things, again, that you might find here that you might not find elsewhere include a focus on digital health. You might ask what digital health is, but this involves um, looking at ways in which large scale data collection around health parameters can happen, uh, how to digitize these data, how to use machine learning approaches in collaboration with people in computer science to analyze these data and so on. We um, uh, also have uh, a fair bit of cross-disciplinary work that occurs on, on the broad theme of climate change, which is often thought to be an ecology-specific thing. In fact, that's what I thought until I came here and met people across a wide variety of departments looking at the anthropology of climate change, the social science of climate change, the economics of climate change, and so on and so forth. Um, there's also a fair bit of work on integrative nutrition and metabolic metabolism um, uh, at multiple levels. So I'll explain a little bit of that as we go ahead because I'll be um, introducing you to the various faculty who work on some of these systems. Um, so uh, we have two people who work on experimental evolution and two people who work on genomics and evolution, thereby looking at complementary um, and different approaches of sort of uh, genomics, giving us a sense of how evolution has played out um, in the field. Experimental evolution, giving us a sense of how uh, evolution can begin to work with small startup uh, populations in a lab. Um, and um, Balaji and Kritika uh, uh, lead the genomics and evolution work. Balaji working largely on bats, Kritika focusing uh, largely on birds, but Kritika is also very involved in the, the Center for Archaeology, um, where they're uh, both using the, these uh, kinds of genomic data to um, uh, bring to bear an understanding of how um, you know, bird histories, uh, domestication uh, histories, and so on have shaped birds uh, in the case of Kritika, uh, and how um, bat evolution and so on has has um, uh, has taken place, uh, which of course uh, uh, assumed heightened significance uh, during the time of COVID. Um, Imroz and Sudipto both do experimental evolution. Uh, Imroz with a focus on uh, disease and immunity. Um, uh, Sudipto with a focus on nutrition uh, and nutritional regimes. Uh, Sudipto works on fruit flies, while Imrose works, Imrose's lab does some work on fruit flies, but largely works on beetles. All right. Um, uh, 
we have several faculty who focus entirely on ecology. Uh, in fact, Shivani uh, of these, Shivani Krishna to the left, uh, who works on pollinator plant interactions um, uh, and did some very cool work recently also looking at the ways in which, um, um, you know, wasp uh, nests are structured, um, you know, uh, is, is really the only member of the biology department. Manvi, Meghna and Divya are all members of um, the environmental science department. Uh, but, uh, you know, we uh, 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 all work together on questions of ecology and, um, uh, you know, they also recruit from um, our uh, students um, for their PhD pool. And they're also approachable um, uh, at any time if you're interested in the kind of work they do. Manvi works on prey-predator interactions between tadpoles um, and dragonfly uh, larvae. Uh, Meghna looks at fire and how fire, um, you know, how forests can be uh, fire resistant or withstand uh, large scale fires. And Divya actually does um, work that is again cross disciplinary with um, uh, anthropological approaches, looking at fishermen and fisher people and how they, um, uh, you know, navigate uh, the process of fishing. Uh, and finally, there are two of us who are neuroscientists, um, uh, and uh, but we take slightly different approaches. Uh, Krishna really overlaps with the cell molecular biology approach because he, uh, as do many of the other people I've already, um, uh, in, uh, you know, uh, described uh, all of the genomics folks and the experimental evolution folks as well. They work. They also work on molecular um, approaches. Um, as does Krishna, he looks at uh, genetics and he looks at um, fun topic: uh, uh, sleep uh, in fruit flies. Um, we work on communication in insects. Uh, that call at night and um, at questions of quantitative cognition in zebrafish um, and uh, neuroeconomics, um, questions of uh, time perception, rationality, and so on. So with that, I will hand over to Anoop. Uh, Anoop, can you hear me? Yes, uh, I can share my screen. That will be easier. Um, for the remaining slides. Uh, before uh, I hand over to you, uh, I will just present a quick slide for those of you who are worried about what jobs you'll get after an Eco Evo uh, <laughs> uh, master's. Um, quite apart from you know academia, research, or teaching um, in the education sector, I think NGOs are the largest um, group that hire people with ecology, evolution, specializing master's degrees. These are nature um, and conservation-based organizations, um, uh, World Wildlife Fund, for example, and several other many, many small organ smaller organizations. Several government service services require people with a master's in this field, policy analysts, for example. Um, and of course, corporate uh, and industri industrial sectors also require and hire ecologists to enable them um, do their um, uh, assessments for environmental impact. Um, and uh, finally, urban planning, design, energy sector. Um, the energy sector uh, needs a lot of ecologists to figure out how they will manage the energy transition moving forward and so on. Um, Anoop, is it okay if I continue to share my slides? Um, uh, you can just say next when you want the next slide. Uh, yeah, I, I just made some changes. Yeah, I, th I, th I think we, we'll, we'll try to go about it. Yeah, then like fine, we'll do that. Okay, all right. Next. All right, um, hello everyone. Um, I'm Anoop and uh, uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna quickly take you through the two other pillars uh, where how the department is structured. But again, just have to give you a, a heads up that uh, it's not siloed. A lot of people whom you see here have a lot of varied interest and uh, we try to categorize them which best way describes what they do. So um, the digital health is, is emerging as one of the key pillars of our research initiatives, and that's headed by uh, Dr. Anurag Agarwal. So Bitu had uh, mentioned a bit about it. Uh, we also have a strong um, immunology, disease biology, and pathogenesis uh, initiatives in research, which was which is sort of described in this slide here. So Kavita heads the infectious diseases uh, uh, research, where uh, she's looking at uh, the various urogenital tract infections and the micro niches, uh, how that affects the, the, the disease progression. If you go to the other end of the spectrum, where you have uh, Dilip looking at the, the structural biology of viruses and what, what, what is the structure of these envelope proteins that could cause these diseases and things like that. And that's the, so he's a hardcore chem biochemist and an electron microscopist. Uh, Rama looks at the human immunology, especially uh, the the CD4 uh, cells, uh, which are which play a pivotal role in in 
and defining our immune responses. Uh, the bottom right, you have uh, Professor Gautam Menon. So he's, uh, you might have seen him, uh, uh, he's an expert uh, in, in many television shows and, and he's very, very popular uh, in, in, uh, in uh, made a lot of policy decisions and also policy uh, modeling. And he works primarily on disease modeling where uh, one, of, one aspect of his work is in disease modeling and he is also trained as a biophysicist. Uh, we have a very strong um, AMR or antimicrobial resistance group, where, which is uh, headed by uh, Dr. Lassia and uh, Dr. Shashidhara. Uh, and we just we are starting up with a, a, a lot of uh, interest in uh, rare genetic diseases. And probably Ashoka University is uh, one of the very few institutes in India, uh, which has a, a dedicated program on rare genetic diseases, which is uh, generally overlooked. And that's headed by the head of the department, uh, Dr. Alok Bhattacharya. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, the other aspect is more of fundamental uh, research. People who are really interested in looking at the cancer and the uh, sort of a non-communicable diseases aspect of it. So um, Dr. Kasuri Pal looks at uh, studies uh, G protein coupled receptors. And so um, she's a cell biologist by training. We also have, uh, uh, for your interest into uh, developmental biology questions, uh, my group looks at how um, shapes emerge in a multicellular organism as it developed from a single cell embryo. I, I, we use um, C. elegans, which is an earthworm. Uh, Dr. Hiroshi Hamada, who uh, joined us recently, uh, has a, a dual affiliation with Ashoka University and NCBS. So students from Ashoka University have an option to uh, go and work, carry out their research at NCBS in uh, Dr. Hiroshi's lab. He works at left-right uh, asymmetry in 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 uh, chick embryos. So how how why is how do organisms uh, get this asymmetry as they develop? Uh, we have a strong uh, energetics and metabolism group uh, headed by Dr. Kasuri Mitro, whose uh, primary focus is at the the, the tiny but very important uh, cellular organelle, which is mitochondria. So anything and everything about mitochondria, how it affects the cellular uh, aspect of it and how it affects the, the metabolic uh, uh, aspect of, of organism is studied in uh, Dr. Mitra's group. Um, an interesting aspect in uh, in Dr. Shogatos Roy's uh, research is he, he studies a circadian rhythm. So he's looking at the molecular biology of uh, the clock, which is the, the which is inherent in all living organisms. And uh, he looks he looks at diatoms and uh, and also his his work uh, has a tremendous implication in uh, to study the ocean uh, the 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 ocean uh, ecosystem. Uh, Dr. Sandeep Ameta, who joined us recently, heads the biophysics group. In fact, he his his work spans biology, chemistry, and physics, where he's looking at. Uh, phase separation of uh, uh, ribonucleic acid proteins, RNAs, uh, and how it affects the, the, the cellular physiology. Next slide, go to please. So coming back to uh, a slide, I won't spend much time here. There are, we have uh, earlier uh, webinars which have uh, spent a lot of time describing this, but it's uh, a two-year program which allows you to take some core courses. And in doing so, you also uh, are uh, going to sort of uh, choose what you want to do and that, uh, that will define your electives. And in, in, in the first year itself, you start to spend time in the lab, uh, trying to know what each lab is about, what they are doing. And then you can, that will allow you to choose your lab for your uh, thesis project, which is in the, in the second year, where you spend a considerable, in fact, the entire year, uh, doing, uh, performing your, uh, your thesis research. Next slide, please. Now, it's an important aspect you want, uh, many of us want to uh, answer is why again pursue um, MSc at Ashoka University. So that's the first, that's a slide we began with. I think it's a good time to revisit this question and ask ourselves uh, this question again and again is what we think uh, is the reason or are the reasons could be that uh, uh, the bunch of uh, uh, educators who are uh, who carry out um, who work along with you. We we are uh, active researchers, and so we believe that uh, being on the bench and uh, also being involved in teaching allows us to inspire the next generation of scientists. 
Um, the second, uh, probably a more uh, nuance, which probably we, many of us overlook, is the ecosystem which Ashoka University provides. Um, so the Ashoka University has an undergraduate program, um, a PhD program, a postdoctoral program, and faculty members who are involved in research. So you are, your development as, a, as, an, as an MSc cohort is happening within this ecosystem where you have access to uh, students who are junior to you or, uh, or and students who are uh, senior to you. So that allows you to also communicate in terms of teaching, develop your teaching abilities. You also have uh, people to look up to when you are when you're planning your next uh, step in your career. So you, this, this ecosystem enables you to bring out the best in yourself. The third is, of course, we have a, a need-based financial aid and something which I'm going to come back again in the next slide. Of, and many of we have a cutting edge research facilities. Many of us, uh, it's probably one of the best uh, uh, research facilities in, in the universities around. Our cohort size is pretty small that allows very uh, specific and dedicated support system and uh, advice. And in put together, uh, what we believe the program provides is a holistic development. So the idea is to uh, identify what your best, what your interests are, and then help and nurture you to achieve that. Next slide, please. So uh, again, this is a two-year program, um, and uh, it's an in-house uh, mandatory residency. And uh, this is a you. You will be with a cohort of motivated students. Um, it's customizable. A wide range of elective courses, as uh, you saw, the kind of faculty members and the research interests are. So you have uh, n number of, research, uh, of of courses to choose from, and you will be constantly guided uh, by an uh, assigned graduate advisory committee, whom you can always fall back on for advice, uh, which would help you to shape your uh, progress and the coursework. There is before you start up, there is a one week uh, boot camp. Uh, to sort of prep you up for the course. And this is primarily uh, for students who might need uh, some sort of uh, preparation in biology or in mathematics. So that sort of help you brush up. Uh, and that's, I think, uh, it's, it's a fantastic uh, initiative, which I'm sure you will, people who are uh, in, in this program will take advantage of. And the first year, as I told you, has some coursework and short research projects where you sort of uh, spend some time in the labs. And the second year is primarily you'll be in uh, uh, doing a thesis research, uh, either in a in lab in Ashoka or outside or in industry, depending on uh, the, the stream you choose to. Next slide, please. So this year, um, the program is, uh, is, is much bigger. Uh, it's a much bigger scale in terms of sky, size, scope, and support. Uh, so from the success in the last two years, uh, we have uh, decided to uh, increase the student intake. So we are very excited that we're going to have a bit bigger classes. Um, and we have uh, much more, many more uh, options in terms of curriculum. Uh, we're going to add options, courses in digital health and systems biomedicine, which uh, probably it's one of a kind uh, at master's level. And we also have options uh, in courses and projects in metabolic diseases uh, and, uh, and related topics. Uh, there is also uh, the students throughout the course of their stay in Ashoka as part of the program are encouraged to participate in talks. Uh, they go for meetings. Uh, when visitors come, they have a constant conversation with them uh, and also conferences. Uh, in fact, uh, uh, a student uh, uh, in, in, in my lab who's, uh, so he's gonna present uh, their work in the conference uh, next month. So that's, that's pretty exciting. So that's the outcome of their the thesis research. Uh, the MSc program at this moment is also announcing uh, smart biomerit scholarships. So that's a 100% tuition and uh, residency wa waiver over uh, the, the need-based scholarship, which was which is usually in place. So the deadline is here, and uh, we encourage you to apply for that as well. Next slide, please. So a good... Uh, uh, assessment of how the program is doing is to know what our current batch, which is just the first batch, which has come out, is uh, what 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 are those those students doing? And uh, we're very happy and proud of what they have achieved. Um, they have cracked a uh, number of uh, competitive scholarships. 
which involves the Corona Scholarship, the DAD for Germany, the CSAR Net, etc. Um, some of them are got offers from uh, overseas institutes like Max Planck and the and the Tel Aviv University for PhD offers. Um, some of them have uh, opted to carry out research uh, positions, joint research positions within and outside Ashoka, like institutes like uh, INSTEM in Bangalore, IGIB in Delhi. And uh, they have also had employment options. Uh, they have some of them are offers from edtech uh, companies and, uh, and scientific communication. And these were, have been aided by uh, the campus placement uh, cell in the university. So we, we work very closely with the, the campus development or the career development office in Ashoka, enabling them to find jobs uh, depending on their niche areas and interest. Next slide, please. Um, and uh, the, the program and the department is ever growing. Uh, we have uh, constant uh, uh, MOU signed with various universities and partner universities, uh, which allows for student exchange and, and faculty exchange that, that would enable you to you know, uh, have a step up to your next step in your academic career. Yeah, any more? If with that, I think uh, um, I will... Uh, Pause and this is the the admission process. Uh, so this has this has been covered in other webinars earlier. So I won't spend time, and uh, I think that's that's pretty much it. Uh, what we wanted to convey. Uh, and uh, thank you so much for your attention. And uh, we're happy to take questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, professors. Uh, that was really interesting. Even as a layperson, I could I could see that it's a really, really beautiful program. Um, there's a question here. Uh, we'll just get on right on to the questions now. Uh, there's a question uh, from the audience that asks the professors to elaborate a little bit more on the scholarship, although it may have been covered in previous uh, webinars. And uh, what is the specific need-based criteria? So, um, Kasuri, would you like to take that uh, scholarship question? Yeah, thanks, Anup. Uh, sorry, I'm taking it from the car. Uh, and thank you, Anup, and, uh, uh, you know, Bitu for, for doing such a wonderful job describing about a program. So, uh, the financial aid, if the question was, uh, you know, about both the financial aid and the scholarship, aid is not scholarship. The financial aid is need-based. And uh, if we start answering that, it will take the whole uh, like rest of the time that we have. So I would encourage you to um, go uh, through our uh, webinar that we did particularly on financial aid. And, and that was done by the financial aid office experts who will actually provide the aid. So in short, uh, your financial need will be determined by uh, the uh, by the paperwork that you are asked to submit. Uh, and uh, we are pretty generous in, in determining who needs the uh, aid. And we do our best to provide the aid to, to that person. And it's not all or none. Different grades of aid is provided and the, based on whatever calculation financial office does, based on the documents uh, you provide. But then the, the scholarship, which is introduced for the first time this year, is actually, as we're calling it, smart bio scholarship. That is completely merit-based. There is no uh, need component in it. Uh, so if you qualify, so the criteria of that is, if you uh, uh, qualify in the top uh, of our merit list, so we'll call six to eight uh, top candidates from our merit list, hold another round of interview uh, with them if they wish to attend uh, uh, the interview and if they wish to access the Merit Bio Scholarship. Uh, so uh, we will gauge their depth of knowledge in biology, their uh, their breadth of knowledge in biology, their innovative thinking, and how uh, uh, how tuned or how able they are actually to, to be transformational leaders in, in their field. Uh, and uh, based on that, we will select two candidates uh, from uh, the six or eight that we invite for the interview to provide tuition waiver and uh, uh, tuition and I think residence waiver uh, for uh, uh, the whole program. And of course, there is a small uh, check, quality check built in, where we will uh, uh, ensure that the merit is maintained 
uh, at the level of you know CGPA uh, by the by the scholarship holders, right? So uh, there's a small quality check there to encourage uh, you know maintenance of productivity. Uh, look them up. Look the webinar up, uh, and also uh, details are provided on the website. Thank you so much, Professor Kasturi. Um, it's great that students can avail of both kinds of uh, aid as well as uh, scholarships. Okay. If uh, I can quickly answer about need-based aid, uh, just so we have a quick sense. Um, so need-based just means that after you get in, uh, you submit financial documents like you know tax documentation to the university. The university evaluates if you have the financial means to pay the fees. If not, then aid is provided. So that's the simple explanation of need-based criteria. Thank you, Professor. Uh, so need-based aid is usually given in the form of a fee waiver, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, um, so on the next it is around tuition or, or, or you know, um, other costs of living and so on. Uh, there's a, another question here uh, about um, campus accommodation being provided. Uh, are all the students, are all the master's students also living on campus? Yes, so there is accommodation is provided, but um, it's not on campus. The university provides accommodation. The, the graduate students live off campus in a dedicated university uh, building. So the reason being that on campus, it's a dormitory. So it's more for undergrads. So we consider graduate students to be much more mature and their working time and things could be more varied than uh, how, what the rules which the undergraduates have to follow. So hence they have a more an apartment style and they have, uh, uh, it's, it's arranged by the university and there is a different shuttles which apply between the campus and the accommodations uh, place. Uh, thank you, Professor. I believe it's very close, um, very close to the campus. It as well. is. It is. There is regular shuttles, which so you don't need to worry about transportation, and it's safe there. So it's... Thank you. Um, now, another question here that I have is, um, if you can please talk about your own research interests. Uh, you had done a really uh, great job of, uh, you know, enlightening the audience uh, about your colleagues uh, research interests as well and the students here are curious about your own research interests and some projects that you're currently working on and if there are any students assisting you in your research uh between you gonna go first or go ahead I'll, I'll go second all right so um yes we we have the broad interest in my group is my lab is uh, is about uh, how do organisms evolve so we are a, we are more than a ball of cells. We are made up of so many millions of cells, but we are more than just a ball. We have a definite shape. So the question we are looking at is how do shapes emerge? How does a cell emerge, a, a multicellular organism like ours, emerge into a particular shape? So that's what we are looking at. And uh, the kind of approaches we take are usually we use a lot of uh, microscope um, and uh, we use a lot of genetics. We load, uh, use a lot of uh, CRISPR-Cas9 um, genetic uh, approach, uh, editing and things like that. Um, we also, um, uh, uh, because it involves shape change, which means just like you make a, a chapati out of an atta, uh, you need to apply some force, right? So same way a group of cells need to apply some force. So our question is also how do, what kind of forces how do these forces emerge from, and how much can we measure those forces? So that's that's a quantitative part of it. So there's a bit of physics also involved. So hence, that's where the interdisciplinarity comes in. So although my question is in developmental biology, my research is in developmental biology, my approaches are microscopy and my and I use uh, concepts in physics. So the answer to the second part of the question, are people assisting? Yes, uh, everybody, every PI which you've seen on the screen, have uh, graduate students, PhD students, and and master students, of course, who would have chosen to apply or uh, uh, work in that in their labs. So yes, uh, my lab was a master student, and uh, very happy with the, what has what the person has achieved. We also have a lot of undergrads who are working, so we have at least five to six people working in the lab on a set of projects in the lab. All right, so. Um... In uh, my lab, we have uh, a variety of um, projects, as I said. Um, in the sense, we have two broad um, uh, model systems that we work on. One is insects and the other is fish. Um, in 
both the insects and the fish were looking at similar questions um, uh, of how it is that quantities of time are structured. So in the case of the insects, this is a question of communication. When I'm talking to you, you're listening to what I'm saying and you're making sense of it based on patterns in time of the ways in which sounds are hitting your ear. And that's actually a very complicated calculation. It's the equivalent of one eardrum of yours, right? Getting tapped in a variety of ways and you're making all of this complex meaning out of um, just that simple tapping process. Um, and uh, so we study how insects do this we study both how sounds are produced and how they are heard, uh, and then how they're interpreted in the sense that we take bits of, of communication, bits of song, play them back, look at their effect, see how small or large of, of you know, sometimes we do extra communication, how much of the, uh, uh, the parts of sound are meaningful, uh, and various questions like that. And we also look at how sound is produced, right? And because we're interested in the evolution of song, we look at different calling variants in the field and we try and understand how their neural structures are different from one another and how they may have evolved from a common ancestor. Uh, in fact, we work with Balaji and Kritika to do genomics work to try and figure out the ancestry of these insects. So um, uh, that's that side of the, the, the lab. And we look at quantity perception, time perception uh, more broadly in fish. Uh, this is because we don't understand how we understand communication. So, you know, your, your school experience, your like, primary school experience would have been 50% learning how to read and write and 50% learning how to do basic math, right? That's the, those are the two main things that you're learning very all in, early on in school. And we understand communication somewhat to some degree, um, but we do not understand how we do very, very basic maths at all. We don't understand how we represent numbers in the brain. We don't understand basic math mathematical operations like adding, subtracting. We don't know how our brains do these things at all. And so clearly, <laughs> that's something important to understand. Um, and uh, so we look at those kinds of questions in fish. One of the reasons it's hard to do this is because we've not thought of good animal models for, in, you know, you can really only dissect a non-human brain. And so you need to find a non-human uh, animal that is dissectable, that is doing, or, or, or that, you know, in the old days was dissectable, that is doing basic maths. These days, zebrafish, the other models organism I work on, is a really attractive candidate because you can look at the entire brain just by imaging the neurons while they are active. So there are little fluorescent indicators that light up and produce light every time the neuron is doing a computation because it releases a little bit of calcium that activates the dye. So you basically watch the brain twinkle like a Christmas tree and that tells you which neurons are active while a task is being done. So we try to train the fish to do tasks and then look at the brain twinkle and try to understand what that twinkling tells us about how math is done. And um, yes, that's essentially what we work on, but we don't just look at simple math. We also look at quantities um, uh, that are relevant to what, what an economist would call economic decision-making, which is when you're trying to figure out whether to buy, you know, you have hundred rupees, do you buy four apples or, you know, oranges? Um, that's an economic decision that you make. So we think of an equivalent decision for zebrafish and we look at how these trade-offs and so on are done, um, whether these animals uh, show economic rationality, which is a principle that is posited by economists to make microeconomists to make their models easier, but may in fact be violated on a routine basis by biological organisms and so on. So those are some of the kinds of questions we ask in FISH. And then we you know, do a couple of other eclectic things, for example, for students who are cut off from labs, who, who work remotely, we enable a citizen science project on looking at quantity perception in dogs because these are just pet dogs and you can train them to, you know, uh, do some of these tasks. So yeah, that's the way that we, um, th those are some of the kinds of things that we do. Thank you so much, professors. That was incredible. Okay, um, going on to, I'm moving on to the next question. Uh, the question on if there are any specific age restrictions to join the MSc uh, biology course. Kasturi, do you know the answer to that question? I don't know of any age restrictions from our end, but... Uh, no, thanks, Vitu. No, absolutely not. There is no age restriction whatsoever. And it's uh, it's open to uh, the whole world. Uh, and, and then there are selection procedures uh, and then adjustments based on, you know, uh, the, your your background that you're bringing in, um, yeah. While while we objectively support, so yes, it's very inclusive. 
So, sir, um, there's a question about separate applications for the Smart Bio Scholarship. Do you know the answer to that question? Uh, yeah, so the Smart Bio Scholarship, you don't have to apply separately, but you have to respond to the email that you are sent out, uh, an invitation email, only if you score, uh, if, only if you're on the, in the top 68 uh, in, in our uh, merit list. Uh, so if you're interested and you score in the top of the list, uh, you'll receive an email along with your offer letter. Uh, and you can choose to say yes, accept I, I uh, accept the offer, uh, offer me to accept the uh, offer to join Ashoka and also accept the offer to uh, attend the interview. But then it does, it does not uh, uh, warrant uh, you to actually, so guarantee uh, that you will get through the top two, right? So we are calling uh, 68 and selecting only the top two from that interview so no nothing else that uh, no other score before that interview is added onto it it's completely that interview performance uh, that we will evaluate to rank those 68 uh, candidates uh professor uh, uh professor kasturi this could be another question uh for you uh which is uh, what is the student teacher ratio and uh, whether there is a set batch size for the msc biology batch yeah, so the student-teacher ratio actually does not apply uh, at Ashoka uh, so much uh, because our cohort size is very small. Uh, with this, si this year, of course, it's going to grow to, say, maybe 25 or so, but you will not, uh, so you will not, other than few core courses, you will actually take more of electives. And in, that, in those electives, there is no telling how many students could there be, right? So I can tell you a range, though. So the range can uh, go from, uh, you know, five students to say for an elective, advanced electives, all of you will take advanced electives. And some some of you who've not, not had any exposure to a subject that you want to go to, maybe you'll take very co undergraduate core classes, which are larger, which could be even 200, right? So if somebody wants to uh, go into computational biology, want to take a math course, so you will take a level one math course where there are more students, right? Uh, so, so again, so it, it all depends on, there's no fixed number. It all depends on what course you will take. But then overall, the cohort uh, size is, since the cohort is guided uh, by a graduate advisory committee, and uh, you will choose your courses, you'll have to be driven. You have to know what you want to do and then choose your courses. But then your uh, uh, graduate advisory committee will guide you, uh, help you decide which courses will actually form a good package for the specialization that you want to launch for yourself. So that'd be a lot of help coming from different sides. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there's another question here on uh, what sort of companies come for placement and where are some of the students working? Although part of this question was already addressed uh, during the session, but in case uh, you know uh, any of the professors would like to comment on the companies that come for placements. Or if not companies, um, then research institutions, et cetera. Yeah, yeah, yeah I can take that. Uh, unopened, uh, uh, Bitu, you can chime in uh, with your experience. So we, uh, where our students go, right? The slide that Anup was talking about. So our students, this is the first batch, first graduating batch. So this is the third year of our master's program. Our first two-year master's program, so our first batch is going to graduate now. And uh, um, in the first batch, I can tell you what students are doing or, or rather intend to do. So students have gotten offers from international uh, institutes, uh, well-known uh, PhD institutes, um, as Anup mentioned. Uh, students have got, gotten a job uh, in uh, education sector, and that is through, our, uh, through the facilitation of our career development office, where uh, the career development office actually is in touch with various companies, which include uh, you know, education companies, biotech companies, uh, uh, any any other job, which may also include, you know, uh, uh, food and nutrition companies or, you know, uh, digital health related companies. These are two job oriented uh, tracks that you will get introduced this year. But anything related to research, the academic part of the department will facilitate and you will also facilitate for yourself. So the career de development office will, will take care of the jobs. And they will, you will actually enroll, or you will be sent out forms to enroll. You will enroll with them from the beginning of your 
uh, somewhere in, in the first year of your program. And you will follow up with them or they will follow up with you uh, based on your interest and, and you know, uh, the companies that, that come in for, for fetching students. But when, if you go to research, uh, even for getting you a research position, if you want to go to a particular place uh, outside Ashoka for your second year research, department will facilitate that. But you have to make your first choice uh, and, and department will um, help you along. Thank you, Professor. Uh, there's a question on uh, the entrance exam. Uh, what kind of preparation is required for the entrance exam? Uh, the paper pattern, the mark structure, if there's a syllabus for this, and uh, whether it'll be held physically at the center or at home. Um, yeah, I can take that also. Uh, so uh, again, I will direct you to uh, direct you to the webinar we we hosted on on this particular topic. Uh, so which is on admissions and financial aid. It's on Ashoka YouTube channel. Please uh, uh, please go through the webinar carefully and our website carefully. All these answers are there. But then there is no syllabus. Uh, we believe that uh, biology is very multidisciplinary and uh, you will have to uh, uh, know certain things. Uh, we follow the pattern of uh, JG Bill's examination uh, where you will uh, be assessed. So I'm talking about Ashoka uh, internal test, right? So that comes in only if you've not taken any of the national eligibility tests, right? Uh, so then you sit for Ashoka uh, entrance test, or if you've taken the national eligibility test, you're not sure you want to improve on it, you can choose to take the Ashoka eligibility test, then your national uh, eligibility test score disappears, okay? Uh, because you've taken uh, Ashoka eligibility test um, or other Ashoka entrance test. And in our entrance test, we uh, format questions in the in multiple uh, areas in the lines of JJ Bills. For example, biology, math, physics, chemistry, uh, computer science, and, and, and general. There's some general uh, science topics and, and to test your awareness in, in science in general, right? So uh, again, no syllabus as such, uh, but you may look up you know questions that come for different entrance tests, national entrance tests, and JJ Bills. Uh, you know, we, we stick to those patterns. But again, after that, there will be an interview, uh, which have to be, uh, I mean, all together, your, your test uh, results and interview performance will be taken together uh, to, 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 give, to make the merit list. Thank you, Professor. Uh, another question, it could be the second last question here, is, uh, Okay, uh, in the application form, we've been asked to upload the JG double E B I L S scorecard, but the scorecard is not shared with the students. Uh, what do I then upload? Yes, yeah. So uh, for JG bills, uh, we have, uh, I believe there's an option of saying uh, in our application portal, there's an option of saying score not available. Uh, so look carefully, we have created that option. Because uh, score is not available for JG Bills, we know that. And there could be other national eligibility tests. At that point, the score may not be available. So you will take that option. You, so we, just follow the instruction and put up the score not uh, uh, available label. And JG Bills scores are actually available to us. We reach out to the, uh, uh, to the test organizers and then obtain the scores for all the students. But you have to say which test you've taken so that we can uh, we can map you with the right test. Uh, the next question is, uh, when will we get to know about the status of our application? Um, again, this is a question from the admissions department. Uh, you uh, should uh, again watch the uh, webinar uh, on this particular topic and feel free to uh, shoot emails to our uh, MSC Biology email that has been given on the website and admissions office does uh, all diligence to respond them from respond to the emails promptly. Uh, so please send your questions only after you've not found the answers to on the website or on the web. Thank you. Uh, the final question here uh, that I'd like to ask the professors is: uh, that, Are there any memorable uh, moments in terms of guest lecturers coming to visit the campus, uh, the the department? Uh, of biology and eminent scientists who come and uh, visit and also have sessions at the university. 
Over to you guys. I've spoken a lot. Yeah, so we have a lot of um, uh, guest speakers. In fact, our problem is more on the side of being too crowded <laughs> in terms of the number of talks we have. Um, so uh, we have a weekly talk. Um, uh, and then over and above that, we often also have um, many visitors who <laughs> sort of surprise us and say, I'm in town, I can come by and give a talk. So we often arrange extra talks during the week. Um, and these are, these, these are um, I'd say about a third or so maybe international talks. Um, uh, you know, um, many of them are, um, uh, you know, there are a lot more, I think, uh, people who are interested in, um, uh, for example, the digital health or the, the disease biology uh, work that, um, that visit us um, on a regular basis. And uh, yeah, so, so, so we do have a very full talk schedule um, and lots of opportunities to interact with um, people from yeah. outside. Yeah, I mean, I, 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 that's that's right. Just to add to that, um, anybody who visits many of these uh, speakers, uh, eminent speakers, um, the, the we make it a point. The department makes it a point that uh, we the, the speakers or visitors get the chance to interact with the students, which includes uh, definitely the, the the MSc batch. So they get to know personally, ask them questions, and you know. Uh, there is a one-on-one -on -one interaction where there is no not there are no faculty members around so you get a dedicated time to interact and that's uh, usually uh, not uh, available in many other places so we ensure that our students get to interact with the faculty visiting scientists also uh, thank uh, you professors if, uh, if i yes. could just add uh, something so uh, my my memorable uh, a visitor will be professor harold vermus who's a nobel laureate in cancer research uh, who actually uh, uh, came and visited Ashoka uh, last uh, year, I believe. Uh, and you actually had Harold Varmus's picture on, on the first uh, slide that British showed. Um, and uh, we also have uh, regular visitors, Professor Martin uh, Matthew Freeman from uh, Oxford. So he heads the Dunn School uh, uh, of Medicine at Oxford. He uh, has visited us consecutively for two years and, and uh, visit is not for one day. So he stays and then interacts with the students and faculty uh, over multiple days, uh, and and that that is that does not start and end with uh, uh, you know uh, regular visitors could could also be over summer. We have school program, Lodha Genius School program, and uh, uh, what, what YSP Young Scholars program uh, to actually ex expose them to Ashoka kind of education. And in those programs, we have uh, a recurring visiting faculty from uh, US and, and uh, from the West and, and you know, established people. So people from Stanford come in uh, this year, people from uh, Stanford, people from Warwick, they are coming in with their own expertise to actually interact with the school students. So and those talks are absolutely open to everybody on campus and any student or faculty are, are open to interact with those uh, visitors as well. So those those are very unique to Ashoka. Thank you so much, Professor. Um, before we close, are there any final thoughts uh, from any of you? Well, I'm excited and looking forward to the the third batch, and uh, you know, we're excited about this program growing, and the size and scale. Likewise, I really hope we got a lot of applicants uh, and applicants with a diverse variety of backgrounds, um, because uh, I think that's what will really um, uh, motivate us to, uh, you know, um, to sort of really take this program forward and to sort of help it reach uh, its full potential as a teaching program. So. Yeah, and just one liner uh, that uh you know, the customizability that you will get uh, to actually walk between uh, disciplines uh, is, is very unique to Ashoka. Uh, and uh, the, the only reason we could even think about customizability, because there are so many disciplines that are available, they have their own strengths. And you could be the one pioneering, maybe you create your own field, right? That field may not even exist. And you could be the one thinking about it and you find your own courses, own faculty to interact with. And then you convince the GSC to facilitate you on that and you could be a pioneer. Uh, so yes, uh, we are looking forward to very driven students and uh, many of you are, we are very sure. A good round, good number of applicants. That's what, you know, uh, Anupin Richie said. Thank you. 
Thank you so, so much, professors. Uh, thank you everyone for joining us for today's webinar. I hope you enjoyed being a part of the discussion on MSc Biology at Ashoka. Please note that the recording of this session will be available on Ashoka's YouTube channel in case you'd like to share it with your friends and do subscribe to the channel in case you haven't already. Uh, before we wrap up the session, we would really appreciate it if you could please take a minute to share your valuable feedback with us. The link to the feedback form is, is provided in the chat box. Please note that the deadline to apply to the MSc Biology program at Ashoka is 26th April 2024. I urge you to apply soon and secure your seat. The application link for this is provided in the chat box. If you have any further queries regarding the MSc Biology program, please feel free to write to us at msc underscore biology at ashoka.edu.in. Once again, I thank our speakers for taking out the time to participate in this discussion. This brings us to the end of this session. Have a lovely evening. Thank you. Thank you, Hemi. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. See you.